Hello and welcome to a new series of citiesabc.com. My name is Dinesh Guarda and I'm here to talk about global thought leaders and provocateurs and people that are changing the world and coming up with better narratives and as well people that have uh, experienced that have been finding ways of rethinking the way we work, the way we collaborate, the way we live in cities and the way as well we act as citizens. Uh, we are in a world that is very disrupted right now by technology, by digital transformation, by COVID-19, by a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, we need more than ever people. We need more than ever ideas, and ideas move the world. But we need as well to keep narrative. A narrative is what binds us together, and as well what takes us to the next level. So citiesabc.com was created with that vision, and this podcast and video series that I've been leading for some time, and I'm very happy to uh, announce that we passed uh, last week actually the 1 million views, has been as well creating um, fantastic inputs and actually profiling some of the global thought leaders that uh, I deeply respect and as well that uh, have a, a work opus that, is, that speaks for itself. So today we have with us uh, David Siegel, and um, David Siegel is someone I deeply respect for his power mind and as well for his capacity to think ahead of the time, but as well to translate into words and into vision um, the biggest challenge that we're facing uh, as humans. Um, he's a thought leader and author um, that is an expert in digital policies and transforming bad policy written on paper to running code that improves governance automatically. I think this quote from him represents a bit of his work. He is as well reflecting personality and author that has been talking about the future of our society, the place of money, and as well how the new machine economy can actually create better solutions and as well positions in a road to digital money. And uh, as well how this can actually co substantiate in better solutions. David Siegel has been in 99 countries and has been teaching from skiing to film theory to home do it yourself and dark chocolate connoisseurs in his part time, I think that's a funny one. And he's as well a provocateur and a professional erratic, slayer of myths and speaker of truthiness, of powerfulness, and defender of the Oxford comma. I'll go there a bit later. And he's, <laughs> reading, he's now leading Right Side Capital and the Giordano Bruno Institute. Uh, he was as well a candidate to be Stanford Dean, and he's been started 20 companies more, or has been the founder of 20 companies plus. So, David, welcome to my podcast. It's wonderful to have you here. I wanted to have this for some time. Welcome. Dennis, my friend, it is great to join you and see you. Fantastic. So, David, I have a lot of questions, and I think this could be going for four hours, but I think we'll <laughs> stay with around one hour. So, I think let's start by your education and basis. And I want to start by that because you are a, a power mind and a power thought leader as well a, a citizen of the world, but as well a, an American, very uh, outspoken in a lot of different things. But give us a bit of your background from education, childhood to university and whatever things you did to be who you are right now. I wasn't a very good student, but somehow I ended up at Stanford in graduate school working in computer science uh, with the famous professor Donald Knuth. Uh, he was my thesis advisor, so I got a master's degree. And then uh, I'm an entrepreneur. So I, I actually worked for Pixar for one year before it came, became Pixar Studios. And then I went back to Silicon Valley to start companies. That's, that's what I enjoy doing. I like to start new things. Uh, and I've done a lot of crazy things, most of which didn't work. Um, I throw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And sometimes something sticks. So uh, I designed a typeface that we became one of the world's best-selling typefaces. Uh, two of the world's best-selling typefaces I designed. And uh, I wrote the first book on web design. That was a long time ago. So I'm, I'm the first web designer in the world. Uh, there's some, some evidence of that on Wikipedia, if you look around. <laughs> and then I started one of the world's first digital agencies in San Francisco in 1994 and uh, worked very hard building websites for seven years or so. I, sold, I, I wrote three books in, that, in the 90s and then I sold the company at the end of 1999. 
and I've been uh, angel investing really badly since then, trying to help other entrepreneurs uh, throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Um, and then I, uh, I was in Switzerland. Uh, I started with blockchain about five years ago. Actually, in 2010, in 2010, I wrote my fourth, my, my fifth book called Pull about the semantic web. And that was a wave that didn't happen, unfortunately. So I, I didn't get to be a big shot from that one. Uh, but it was my best book for sure. And it's about how to use data in a smarter way, which didn't happen. We use, mostly we use data in dumb ways still. <laughs> and it's not as effective as it could be. And then came the blockchain and I was in the blockchain pretty early. Um, uh, working a bit with consensus in 2015 and then writing a lot in 2016. And then I had the ICO that I led for Pillar Project in 2017, when you also led an ICO. So we both were part of that boom. Um, moved to London to build the Pillar Wallet, which is in the App Store. And you can, you can download your Pillar Wallet and use it. Uh, and, then, um, and then I... That was 2017, so we built, Pillar was, uh, I think as many as 50 people full-time. Now it's about 25 people full-time. And, uh, and then my kids moved here to Washington, D.C. I live about a mile from the White House, which is a really scary place to live. <laughs> I'm sure at the moment, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the United States is a wacky country. I wouldn't live here except my kids do live here, so I... I moved from Europe to be with my kids and I, I am with my boys about three nights a week and have a really good time with them. So I'm, I'm happy to be with them. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I don't really live in the United States. The same as you, I live online. I live wherever is the action, wherever the people, wherever I need to be, that's where I am, right? Uh, and I'm trying to get a few things started here in the United States. So, David, there's a lot of stuff to go, and I'm, I'm particularly excited. I want to talk, you mentioned the, the blockchain, and you've been actually one of the leading blockchain researchers and as well uh, entrepreneurs as well, like you mentioned with Pillar, which was one of the biggest ICOs as well. It was a massive, um, and a lot of other things you did. So, I, I want to touch a couple of things, so, so probably we will be touching, first of all, uh, your books, as well your ventures and as well then the ideas probably for the last or I, I probably can start with it by by the ventures first Let, let's start by the ventures first i'll leave that for you but uh, in terms of ventures uh, give us a bit of an update because on the 99 like you said some of them succeed others fail pillar probably was the biggest one um and it's, it's still going on and uh, and a lot of yeah. other things on that level so let's start with pillar and your work on the blockchain because that's a big thing to say less right i mean uh there's a 20, he's 26 year old kid named Vitalik Buterin who's really inspired a whole, a lot of people. And with the concept of smart contracts, I just jumped right on it and started writing about the possibilities. Uh, and the more, there's two things that happen when you get serious about blockchain. One, you talk with a lot of lawyers about what you can do and what you can't do. And two, you start to realize how broken our systems are, how broken our, our uh, ecosystems and our uh, 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 policies are. And that probably gets me very upset. I, don't, I like to fix big problems, not small problems. So if it's, if it's, and it's the same with global warming too. We've talked a little bit about that, I think, in the past. If, if it's a really big problem in the trillions of dollars, I'm interested in trying to figure out how to solve it. Because when people are doing things that, you know, society is moving forward, right, Dennis? And cities are a big driver of improving quality of life around the world. Cities are going to be one of the big drivers of this century. And so is technology. And so is policy. And so I spend my time trying to help communicate that technology is important and we have to, you, you read my recent piece, we have to think that, that technology is going to take away the repetitive work, the repetitive jobs, and that's important, that's great. So let's get rid of those, let's move it forward. Let's get 
technology taking away those jobs right now so that people can get better jobs than just doing repetitive tasks like driving an Uber or, uh, or doing accounting. You know, all of that stuff is going to be done by machines. So let's, let, I, I'm, a, I'm wide awake at night when I go to sleep thinking that how can we solve big problems so that all of humanity can go up? So that billions of people, two billion people at the bottom of society can rise as a byproduct of our, of our work in the developed world. And I'll give you an example. If you go to Africa, and you've been to some places in West Africa, people have phones. Most everyone has a phone. They, 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 nobody has a car. Some people have a scooter, but everybody has a phone. And that is a trickle down effect from, from the, the developed world. And many, many people have access to the internet. Again, a trickle down effect. And that raises the quality of life for so many people. And in the last 30 years, we have seen a remarkable transformation in, in the poor areas in, in, in the developing world. The quality of life has gone up. We have many fewer people living on $1 a day. Most of those people are now living on eight and 10 and 12 and $15 a day. And the quality of life for the bottom couple, two billion people has gone up dramatically. Now we, we have much more to go, but this is what I think about. How do we raise the quality of life for the most, the largest number of people? And technology is a big part of it. And then, and then reducing or changing policy to allow technology. When you created Pilar, uh, David, in terms of Pillar, so tell us the story because I think it was one of the, the catalysts of the, the ICO world, which right now is a bit defunct, but it's still the STOs, there's a lot of things going on still. And actually, to be honest, he created the, the mainstream uh, uh, ecosystem that we have right now with, with Facebook creating Libra, and as well with major banks and organizations around the world right now moving to, to, uh, to blockchain and, and to ICO. So, can you tell us yeah. about this, Rio? I know that you're right now not so involved with Pillar, but you are the CEO and founder, and you led the project until actually this year, I guess. Um, yeah. So just give us an overview about the Pillar project, your history on that, sure. and as well, how did you come to blockchain, and as well, all the research that you did around that. Well, I, I just, uh, more than the blockchain, because I, I, I've been through several waves of technology, yeah. and it's never about the technology. It's always about people. As you know, it's always about people thinking new ideas and trying new experiments and doing things in new ways. That was true when we had the first spreadsheet. It was first true when we had the first digital camera. It was true with the first digital movie or the first websites or anything. It's never about the technology. So I have been talking for 20 years about this concept of the personal data locker. And I wrote a whole book about it. That's, that's much of what this book is about. Why? is all of our data on the servers of a small number of large multinational companies. Where's your data? Where's your data? It's on insurance companies. It's on Google. It's on Facebook. It's on Microsoft, uh, Zoom. It's on all, it's on the, you know, drug companies and hospitals. It's on the servers of many of large companies and you don't have it. You don't have your personal data. I don't have my personal data. Most people, we don't have our personal data. So I've been talking about this for 20 years. And when I saw the opportunity for an ICO, I said, look, this, I want to build a platform that is, that is nonprofit, that is open source, to give people an operating system for, based on their personal data. The operating systems are iOS, Mac, uh, Windows, and Unix. Or Linux, those are the main operating systems. We don't. We only have that a few operating systems. And I said, this is this is from the 1980s and 90s. That's great. But for the 21st century, we need an operating system that is based on our own, where we own our own personal data and we manage it, and nobody else monetizes it. We monetize our own personal data. So that's what the Pillar Project was about. The white paper. Uh, talks all about personal data and how we should have our own personal data. It could be right here. It could all live on the blockchain. 
and it could all just be uh, available to us to make our lives better, but it isn't. It's available to Apple to make the shareholders more profit. If you have a digital assistant like Siri or Alexa, those digital assistants don't work for you. They work for the companies that own them. And so uh, the Pillar Project was about the idea that you should own your own personal data. I was lucky, it was the right time, and about 10,000 people uh, gave money for that. And we started the nonprofit, and we launched the very first wallet, but it took a long time. Uh, there were engineering problems. And uh, I would like to say that the organization was very efficient, but it wasn't. It took some time to settle out, to find the right people, to, to get an efficient organization together. Um, and now they're working hard on adding improvements to their ecosystem, which is around the pillar token. And it's much more about uh, making, making use of the pillar token in the uh, crypto ecosystem of, uh, you, you know, decentralized finance and, and uh, um, non-fungible tokens, you know, th things that are kind of cool in the Ethereum world at the moment. Um, but it's less about personal data. Um, so I'm trying again. Um, I'm continuing to hammer away for 20 years at the idea that we should have an operating system based on our own personal data. That should be the operating system for the 21st century. Um, there were many other exciting moments in the last six years of, of blockchain, and I've written quite a bit about insurance, about how law will be different about how uh and many people you know there's a lot of obvious uses in supply chain and and so forth but i've i've also been become very interested in stable coins and money so last year i headed up a research lab at pillar to investigate uh stable coins and i've written quite a bit about stable coins also i believe in standards for data so i started a a digital standards project last year for um, data standards for tokens like uh, stable coins and uh, and uh, security tokens unfortunately that didn't really get going either it's hard to have a standards group when there's so much noise you know going on in the for example if you look at if you look at security tokens okay what is going on in security tokens well everything got sucked back by regulators into the old world framework. So now all the security tokens have to be fully compliant. And I was the CEO last year of a company that went through the sandbox with the FCA to get a license to you know, issue security tokens. And it's all very, very old school, just replacing paper, bits of paper with tokens, with blockchain nothing really very innovative and no liquidity. So it's going to be a long time before that new world emerges out of the old world because the regulations are so heavy and because the regulators grabbed everything. The, the regulators grabbed all the tokens and said that they were securities, right? And then look at what happened with uh, Kick. Look at what happened with Telegram just last week, right? The regulators, you know, really hit hard and came down on the side that these things are not allowed to innovate, which I think is tragic. It's really set us back a long, a long way. And now uh, uh, I just released a piece, a piece today about how we, we have to look hard in the mirror and ask ourselves, is regulation really working? Or is regulation mostly left over from 1930, 1940, 1970? Uh, is regulation holding us back? And I believe it's really holding us back. So the pillar project continues, and now I want to start again to do it without a token, without blockchain at the beginning, uh, but have people own and use their own data for their own purposes. That's what, it, for me, that's what I keep coming back to. So as someone that has been uh, in the inception of the beginning of the internet, you were in Silicon Valley when yeah. things started. Um, you were as well on the academic, on the research, and as well on the thought leadership, but as well on the entrepreneurial side. And then you went in the wave of, the, let's say, from the wave of the internet inception to the wave of the, the second 
internet of trust, like Don F. Scott mentioned, to the point where we are now. And we are right now in a very broken uh, situation. Like you just mentioned, we have a huge challenge, let's put it that way, that we have, first of all, a, a very crazy geopolitics. And, and I'm not talking about the geopolitics, even the internet is a geopolitics, because we have Silicon Valley in one, one end, uh, China in another one. And yeah. China right now, I think, is more advanced than Silicon um, if you look especially at finance and everything happening with blockchain and a lot of other things. Um, so I, I want to ask you, and of course you, you've been preaching and as well researching and leading in the idea of data ownership, but as well the way how to put that in technology platforms that actually can empower us. Um, so how do you see this evolution? Because we let this happen in the end of the day. And I think uh, we all, all of us as well, we are technologists and people leading companies. Um, at the moment, we have five companies probably leading most of the technology in the planet and owning all the data of the planet. And then on the top of that, we have the Chinese government. So we have like a very strong <laughs> dichotomy. Uh, at least there's one country. But, but the point is that these companies don't, don't, don't uh, report to any country. And for instance, one thing, as you are provocative, I want to provoke you as well, but in a good way. For instance, if you look at the cash flow um, of most of the countries in the world, there's no positive cash flow. There's only debt. So all the countries in the world, probably the exception, and I, I don't think right now there's, there was a list of po countries with positive cash flow that was before COVID-19. I think now there's no, for instance, Germany had like around 150 billion euros of cash flow positive. But for instance, Apple at the moment, uh, there was a study recently, they were saying that they have around $225 billion of cash flow positive. Um, or reserves, money reserves, and uh, and as well, they have more than five hundred billion in reserves. Okay, well, yeah. so that number is even bigger right now. So see, this is more than most of Europe together. <laughs> most of uh, the US has only trillions of debts, and now we are creating more money, and as well creating a, a kind of weaponization of the financial and, and trading unit. So this is much more serious than just data. Okay, there's an one end data, but there's as well a completely toxic financial ecosystem and you let this happen all of us because in the end of the day we are all part of the picture of course some people are more responsible than us but how do you see this as a thought leader and i know that you're researching a lot of ideas how to take this but you can only yeah. fix the problem if we really go to the deep of the problem and this is a big problem because in one end people like us are very advancing understanding the technology understanding the concepts, understanding the ideas, but the rest of society is still offline. For instance, 90% of the business in the world don't even have websites, and most of the business operations in the planet is paper, not even digital. So we have a lot of challenges, um, and you know that better than anyone else. So how do you see this, especially from the Angular, uh, or from the, the road the, uh, digression in the sense of starting with Silicon Valley, inception of the internet, the second stage of the dot-com boom, then the, the blockchain inception, which right now is becoming mainstream, and eventually we'll have as well the machine economy that you are as well talking about. I would like to go from the beginnings because you are part of Silicon Valley and as well with Stanford and so forth. Well, I, I'm reading an interesting book called The Rise and Fall of American Growth. And the statistics, the data shows pretty clearly, Dennis, that America led the world and in innovation from 1870 to 1970, it was a miracle uh, transformational century when people's lives, lifespan went up by 50% or more. And we invented healthcare and we got education and everybody went from a subsistence farming to in cities, which improved people's lives tremendously. Since 1970, there has been a real slowdown in innovation. And it seems like, like you just said, it seems like everything is digital and it seems like we have supercomputers in our pockets and it seems like it's accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. But, but really, uh, innovation is, is lagging and there, there has been a kind of a, a, a plateau from very steep to a plateau of innovation in the last 30 years that that economist Tyler Cowen calls uh, the great complacence, the complacent class. And uh, if kind of, if, if you think about millennials, uh, they're not really inventing very much. They're more consuming and they don't have so much attention span and they're just sort of playing with 
That's not for everybody, of course. It's a generalization, but they're more playing with the toys and not really innovating. Not they're not starving it out and scraping it and building, right? And that's that's what we're not doing so much. And that's what Silicon Valley is all about. So I'm I'm used to really pushing. And in technology, we are too much sliding by with, and I, I'm going to use this word. I want people to remember this word with monopolies because the, the venture capitalist who puts money into some project, whether it's Facebook or Google or some little thing you never heard of that came and went, uh, that venture capitalist is interested in one thing, monopoly. That venture capitalist wants a multi-billion dollar exit of a company that just dominates its industry. And every venture capitalist wished that he could put the first money into Google. Right? I was part, I was an investor in a hedge fund or in a venture fund that put money into Google at about 85 cents per share. And then it went up to $350 and we sold. And that's the goal. And I'm afraid that that is not so good. Uh, if you look at what happens with companies like Facebook, they start to take over the trust, right? They start to take over their industry and like Amazon, I don't think we want to go back to the days before Amazon. I don't. I probably order five to 10 things every week, almost one thing a day from Amazon. I'm, I'm crazy about Amazon, uh, but, but Amazon is a monopolist. Um, and as you point out, you know, Dennis, what percent of United States retail is Amazon? What do you think? It's massive. <laughs> it's almost what do you becoming think is the percentage of retail sales in the United States by Amazon. But it's not just retail sales, is that they are the biggest fintech player in the world. They are the biggest retail player. Let me ask you, United States, what do you think is the is the percentage of retail sales? And this would also be retail to Two businesses, you know, if a business is buying, uh, you know, on contract or something, what what do you think is the is the percentage? First, we're talking about 226 billion the U.S. dollars projected, and 320 300 billion on 2020. You're talking probably around 70, 60, 70 percent of the retail, or getting close to that. Five percent. Only five percent. Five percent of retail. In fact, all of e-commerce is about 12 percent of retail. In the United States wow. right now right now as you said we are not as digital as we think right we're not wow. as online as we think that's right and so number one that shows us we have a long way to go number two um, it shows us that a company can have a monopoly with only five percent of the uh, of the total business and, and a monopoly is in the case of Amazon Amazon keeps prices low so it's not, it doesn't, they don't have a monopoly to raise prices. They have a monopoly to hold your, onto your wallet, to make a sticky uh, a experience that you don't want to leave, right? To make it so Alexa just orders things, is a mind reader and just orders everything you need, you know, without you, with, reduce the friction, right? Uh, and yet that makes it very difficult for competitors to come in and try to build better rails better infrastructure. Um, Amazon is going to build the retail delivery infrastructure of this country and probably of Europe, uh, uh, whether we like it or not. What would I prefer? I would prefer that that's open source, right? I don't think one company should own the roads. I don't think one company should own the airports, right? Or the delivery trucks. But if Amazon wants to buy UPS, they could do it like that. You know, that would be, that would be a quick one. And it's almost impossible to get through the supply chain to the customer without using Amazon somehow. And I think that's probably in the long run, not so good. Um, and so I, I believe that this concept of, of, um, of monopoly leads, leads big companies to get bigger and leads big companies to hire lobbyists and to make sure that the playing field is designed for big companies. And this is exactly what we have in FinTech. Uh, the regulations are great for banks because banks can hire hundreds and hundreds of compliance people and startups can't. 
and the banks can hire hundreds of lobbyists, which they do, to make sure things don't get too innovative and preserve the status quo. So, and, and regulators and politicians are happy to work with big companies and lobbyists that have a lot of money. There's really no problem there. So it's a self-reinforcing cycle of big things getting bigger, right? And that's not so good for the little guy. It's not so good for everybody, for you and me, uh, for, for, for normal people, because they have fewer choices, right? And that, and that hurts innovation. So, if you, so one way to look at it is that as companies have been as the the S and P five hundred has become dominated by ten companies, you know, or fifteen. So innovation has to some degree slowed down. And the way we get innovation is many many people trying many many things. And I'll tell you, venture capitalists as a group are very risk averse. They want to put money into the big thing that everybody else is putting in money into. They're looking for signals of the herd going in the same direction and they would much rather put 20 million dollars into an 80 million dollar round than to put a lot of small half million dollar checks into small companies that are less proven right so they're not helping they are all going toward fueling and funding the big things getting bigger i'm much more in favor of many 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 small things using open source, you, you know, making the playing field level so everyone can compete, but not roll up everybody else into some giant trillion dollar company. That's, uh, well, there's a lot of things over there. Um, I want to touch one thing because of your work. So coming back again to trying to go through this three, how this happened, okay? And, and there's a very good point, and I think it's a massive quote that uh, Amazon did the biggest monopoly in the world with 5% of the retail in the US. And probably much much less around the world, which and as well created the wealthiest man in the world. So, um, but uh, what I would like to touch is so if you look at the evolution of Silicon Valley and the evolution of the internet. So the internet started as a decentralized open source dream, right? Okay, by academics, right. and at the moment uh, mostly. So it comes back to ideas. So the technology reflects only ideas. And as well, the financial models that we apply to the technology are reflected in ideas and as well, the real world that we have behind us, because of course, this all comes back to the reality that we have around us, okay? So I'd like to go through that. So let's say from your experience working in the inception of Silicon Valley, being in Stanford as well, which is one of the key, probably the key university that created Silicon not, Valley. Not quite, the inception of Silicon Valley was really the 1970s, Yes, and I I was there in the early '80s. So so the I would yeah, say, no, I know I know I understand. No, I'm actually, just saying it was the '60s. It was the '60s. So I I would call it the second wave anyway. Yeah, but but the first wave was very internal. Okay, it was mostly for the United States. It was it was semiconductors. Yes, and it was only probably for the United States. I think this it was the second wave that took Silicon Valley as the the biggest economical software. driver in the it world. It was so software. Yeah. Most, yeah. And it was as well, the, that first wave was mostly for the United States. It was not completely outside of the United States, probably just a bit of Europe and a bit of Japan. But if you look at the last 20 years, the acceleration of digital, for instance, China only is 15 years old, okay? All the digital transformation of China was 15, actually 10 years. So right. the acceler But the thing is that China in 10 years passed already most of the innovation that we have in all the world. But my question, independent of whatever you like it or not, is a fact. That's but I right. think coming back to that that history, because you, let's say you are you were there in the eighties, and of course Stanford, most of the, the unicorns or actually not unicorns, the trillion dollars companies came out of Stanford in one way or the other, um, or they were at least uh, uh, VCs related with that. So, and you as well as an alumni, and as well someone that was partly almost to become a dean of, of Stanford. So, how do you see that that relationship as well, and how do you? How did you end up here? Let's put it that way. Because if you're going to change something, and I think one of the things you're talking is for us to own our data. I think we need to go deeper. And I think your area of the machine economy and as well um, the digital money is key, but it has much more about digital empowerment or as, at least money empowerment with data and stuff like that. But I, let's, let's look at the history because I, I, 
as an academic, or at least as someone that is a researcher, you have as well that part. So let's look at history, and I would like to hear your views being there, and as well being in a lot of companies that they were part of this. Um, how do they end up here? Let's put it that way. <laughs> because well, I mean, that you have monopolies, it's all over right now. And you've been all over in the history of the, United, of the, of the world, not just the United States, yeah. I lived for 20 years in Palo Alto, in, in Silicon Valley, and another six years, I think, in, uh, in San Francisco. And the most important thing I can mention is that it's okay to fail. It's okay to try things there. It's on your resume, it's not so bad. If you had three or four things that didn't work, nobody cares, that's all fine. Um, that's very different from the rest of the world. So you have permission to try things, to innovate. In Silicon Valley and and so much of the innovation never gets out I can I, I can't remember how many startups I went to visit or had lunch with people or met them and they were going to change the world and they were going to do a big thing and then they didn't you know they, they came and went it, went it all went went away because they ran out of money and there's almost nowhere else except maybe Israel where you can do that and have it be okay so the speed the cycle is much faster the cycle of trying things is much faster there. That's the one thing I learned, I think, from all my years there is that um, you have to, and that's a big part of what Bezos does at Amazon. It's okay to try things, try it quickly and learn as quickly as you can. If you find a little bit of success, then you can build on that. Uh, I came to, to live in New York uh, because I was a little bit bored of Silicon Valley and I, um, I liked, the idea of living in New York and I, I got a nice place there and I, I met a nice woman from Switzerland and we had, I had a family. So that was a different stage of my life. And that's when I wrote that book from 2010. Um, but I haven't really, I didn't really, uh, I was investing and sitting on boards and uh, learning during most of that time. And then when the blockchain came, I thought, wow, you know, this is a new, this is new land. Right, we're going to jump on this and we're going to build, because that's what I like to do. I like to build things. Um, so I thought that was just a breath of fresh air and a real opportunity to change the world in a big way. And I wrote a lot about it. I've written, you've read some of my writings about blockchain. I just think blockchain is this liberating empowerment of the individual of individual identity, individual rights, about uh, uh, decentralized co collaboration between people that, that don't have to have elected representatives or a formal structure. They can just, you know, have, I don't think you have been to Burning Man. Have you been to Burning Man? No, no, but I have a lot of friends. I Everyone should go to Burning Man at least once in your life if you it's like the the pilgrimage you know it's it's a, i think if you're alive you should have a goal that you should go to burning man at least once now this year burning man is not happening uh, in real life burning man is online this year this is a very very resilient community of people with a very small number of rules and a lot of enthusiasm and love to help each other and to play together and a lot of great things come out of that community. And this year, they are fully online. They're do, going to do spectacular things. I'm really excited to see what they're building online this year. And that kind of very little structure with a lot of dynamic energy and a lot of anybody can try anything is the kind of thing we need to increase the the economic growth. And you mentioned China. You know, China grew at 8% for 15 years. Okay, nothing does that. That's a unique in world history. I don't think China can ever do that again. That was catching up. It's called, in economics, we call that catch up, catch up economics, catching up because they, they used our technology from the developed world to uh, scale up their, their rapid rise. And the United States was not able, hasn't, and Europe, Europe is asleep as I, I have said that in the European Union. Um, I have, you know, Europe is, is the continent, you know, the, comp the continent in the, in the world with the slowest growing economy is Antarctica. The second slowest is Europe, <laughs> right? <laughs> and the United States has been complacent with two and a half, three percent 
growth on a good year for the last 40 years. And, and by the way, I'm not too worried about debt. People make a lot of alarm about the debt. I don't think it's a particularly big deal. We live in a time when repayment of debt is fairly easy. I don't think it's toxic. Uh, I do think that in the United States, our, uh, our social security program is a bit toxic because that hasn't been managed that well. And it's, it's it, you know, we have a structural problem in some countries where older people are getting more and more and the younger people are not replacing, right? If you look at, if you look at uh, India, it's, it's getting more top heavy with older people. If you look at much of Asia, it's very young. Many, many countries in Asia are, are still quite young. Many countries uh, in Africa are still quite young. Nigeria is quite young. Uh, Japan, Europe, United States are top heavy with people in older age brackets and the younger people can't make enough money to pay the, the social programs for the older people. So there are some structural problems with societies, uh, but debt is not one that I worry about at all. And job replacement, job, uh, technological unemployment, I'm not worried at all. I'm sure there will be plenty of jobs. We'll have 9 billion people in about 30 years on planet Earth, and we will have enough jobs. I'm not, I don't worry about that. Uh, what I worry about is that, is that our policies are slowing us down, is that we long-run economic growth is the driver of quality of life. This is something I really want people to understand. Long-run economic growth, if you can grow your GDP at 4 or 5% per year and not have recessions and not have pandemics, and not have bad management of pandemics and not have idiot presidents who don't know how to manage the healthcare, help the healthcare system and not have uh, uh, shocks take us back, but keep growing, growing, growing. 5% is transformative. I mean, 8% for China was insane for 15 years. That was, that's, you know, that's why there's so many rich people in China now. It's not the rich people, it's that the bottom of society has risen a lot. So the middle class has risen, has grown tremendously in China because of this growth engine. And the middle class in Europe is shrinking because we don't have enough growth. And the middle class in the United States is shrinking because we don't have enough growth. I'm hopeful that Africa's middle class has a chance to rise and it depends a lot on what what regulators and lawmakers and politicians do because long run economic growth solves a lot of problems. It creates mega cities, which you know a bit about. Mega cities and cities in general are going to be the new political unit. Cities are going to be the political unit. Um, they are already. They are already. They are already. And that's, that's really important. It's not, I don't, I, I keep trying to not use the word regional because regional, you can have a large region with not many people. Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. a region. It's cities that are at the epicenter of growth. And that's where the quality of life goes up. And what we have to do is stop tripping ourselves. And we're so tripping. One question, I, David, yeah. one question I have. Why are you not worried with debt when we have, at the moment, the world economy with a completely toxic level of debt. And that's yeah, all the problem is I that. I agree with that. Uh, but but, but yeah. uh, I want to just ask that. So there's yeah. the debt, but there's as well the trading of derivatives. So sure. The, and the problem right now is that, okay, for people like us, I think we understand this, but the problem is that the rest of society, okay, and as well, like you mentioned, Europe is old, um, Japan is old, and Japan is the fourth economy in the world. Uh, and, the, and of course, Europe is the second economy in the world. Um, so the challenge right now, and actually even right now, the United States is becoming the second economy. India will be the third. And I think, uh, um, so actually, yeah, the second economy in China, of course, is becoming the first. So the challenge yeah. is that, and of course, like you said, most of African emerging markets are 20 years old. So of course, they will be the ones growing and leading the world economy. That's right. But the challenge right now, so this debt, I understand in one end why you mean that it's not so important, but in one end, it's very important because it's a big amount of debt that is, the, the problem is that if there would be a bit of wisdom 
for the part of our geopolitical leadership, that would be okay because we can actually clean debt and take it forward. But what we have right now is a schizophrenic level of debt where people are, or a lot of central banks are just creating more money. But of course, it's not sustainable. Someone will have to pay for this or someone will have to... Uh, let's say if let's say if the United States put three trillion dollars, China probably put another trillions, and the Europe put another trillion dollars, and the UK put another trillion dollars. Okay, this money is all fake. We're going to have an inflation or a deflationary situation. This will be burning. No. Well, I want to hear your opinion on that. We don't have enough time. I want to do a, a session on inflation, and I proposed it to consensus, but they said no. We don't. Uh, we don't believe in the dollar, so we're not going to host your event. So I'm, I want to work with someone, and I would love to work with you, to do a one-hour webinar where people can ask questions about inflation because people don't understand inflation. This is not – This is not. you tell me, what's the inflation rate right now in Europe? What's the inflation rate in the United States? I, I don't have the numbers, but – They just, they just they got done good. printing $4 trillion. Yeah. Where, what's, what's the inflation rate? I don't have it with me now, but less than one percent. Less than one percent. I mean, you can look around, Dennis. You can see that housing is not shooting up. You can see that stores are not open. They're not selling. They're selling stuff at low prices just to get the inventory out. You can see yourself anecdotally that prices are not really rising, and except for medical, you know, supplies and certain things, they are. But the air, airlines and and travel. I mean, all these places are just dropping prices just to get anything going at all and and inflation is going to come in in the united states the target for inflation is two percent and they're not going to hit it this year so what we need right now is five four and five percent inflation right now to move the economy and then we can drop it back i would love to talk more about yeah, inflation because people don't get it but i don't have time now to really go deeply into it but bottom line is uh, inflation is not debt. So printing money is not debt. Debt, fiscal spending is, de is borrowing. Fiscal spending is debt. I'm not too worried about the debt. I wish that governments would not spend half their money on uh, arms and military. I think that would be smart. I think most governments spend 40% of their budget on military, which is probably ridiculous. And we could we could not have to borrow money to do that. Uh, I also think that that education is completely broken and we should not invest in education. I've written that you cannot fix education. You have to reinvent it. And that's what my new institute is about. So we'll talk more about that. And I think the general level of borrowing at this general level of interest is not out of hand. It's not crazy. Uh, we don't want to double the national debt from here. That would be getting toward uh, more of a, that would be more of a looming crisis that could break later. But right now, the debt levels are relatively acceptable. And you can see, for example, that Japan has had debt levels of about three times GDP for 30 years, and they've managed it okay. Uh, is it great? It's not great. Is it terrible? It's not terrible. I understand. No, it's a good point, and I think, yeah, like you said. So, so let's go to to your new institute, um, and let's go as well towards the the your idea and vision in terms of first of all digital money, and as well machine economy. Right. So, a lot of people don't understand economics. Even people who get Nobel prizes in economics don't really understand how the economy works, and it's hard. Uh, and I've done a lot of work on this. I'm a follower of one economist who I think is the best. His name is Scott Sumner. And I try to explain his views. Uh, there's another good one called Tyler Cowen. I try to explain how the, I'm not an economist. I'm an explainer and I understand it pretty well. So I'm trying to explain to people that first of all, the great recession from 2008, 2009, was not a housing problem and it was not a lending problem. It was not a subprime mortgage. It wasn't a mortgage problem. It w it's hard to see this, so I'm just gonna say something that sounds crazy, but it was a, a result of too little housing, not enough housing in certain cities in the United States 
that prompted a wave of migration of people out of the crowded cities, the primary cities like New York and San Francisco, into the secondary cities where they ended up buying homes that uh, were a little bit, it was a different market so they could afford more, so they did buy more, it wasn't subprime. And when, uh, let's just say the shit hit the fan that there was not quite enough uh, uh, income to pay for the, all those mortgages, it wasn't too bad, it was just a drop. Instead of a reversal into negative territory, it was just a, a cooling off of the housing market the Fed did the wrong thing and the Fed caused a recession that then the Bank of England and the, and the European Central Bank multiplied into a worldwide recession. And we lost about a trillion, sorry, we lost about two billion jobs for about three years because of what the Fed, of the Fed not managing the money supply properly. They should have been printing money. They should have been dropping rates to zero. They should have been much more aggressive. It should have been much more expansionary, and they didn't. So money was too tight. And I won't make this technical. I've written a lot about this, but money was, that was too the, tight. That was the reason the economy didn't collapse right now in COVID-19, because they print money. Yeah. Thank goodness. You don't want to live in a world where central banks no, no, are I agree, I agree. Right now. Yeah, just say on that it's, level. It's yeah. the only thing they can do right now and later, when, in, when we have inflation, let's say inflation, we can catch up to 2% inflation. Let's say we can pass it for a year or two and be at 3 or 4% inflation. Then, then they can easily dial it back. People don't understand this. People think, oh, hyperinflation. It's not true. They can just sell those assets and dial it back. It's the central banks can control the price of anything in the long run. And so it's, it's, they're doing more, in fact, Right now, they're not printing quite enough money. They could be printing more money. It would be better. It would be because we need the stimulus right now. And that's not debt. That is printing money out of thin air, and they should be doing more. Now, uh, let's get back to, though, to, to general economic principles. What we're doing right now is trying to come out of a really bad pandemic where we still don't understand the disease where we still have a broken healthcare system as a result, and where we're trying to get short-term recovery going in the economy. People going to a theater, or people going to a party, or people going to a, you know, seems like, it seems like uh, liquor stores are essential businesses <laughs> during this time, which I find kind of funny. Uh, but we need the essential businesses to ramp up and to have people you know, move money, spend money, get the economy going. That is a, I, I would call that a short-term problem. That's not a problem that, that a central bank can have a huge influence on. But if they print money, if they create some inflation, it helps. Now we need people to find a way to do more business. And it certainly isn't going to work to go back to movie theaters and parties. Uh, that's that's going to continue to be a problem. So, so look, Dennis, this is a very serious demand shock, right? And this is going to continue for the, and it's going to continue in Europe, in Asia, in the United States for at least six more months, probably two more years. It's going to reshape a lot of businesses. It's going to destroy a lot of businesses. It could destroy banks, could destroy some banks that have too many, too many derivatives on their books that are not performing. Um, and so we're going to see, but, but what, what's necessary is to try to solve the medical problems first, that is treatment, prevention, vaccine, right? Prevention, treatment, and vaccine, and then try to solve the midterm, the stimulate people to go back to work as soon as possible, however we can, and then long-term to have a vaccine and have an economy that, that is functioning again. And that's where central banks can make a bigger difference. Uh, central banks can't really put out the fire uh, of the immediate need, right? To get uh, people, people who can't pay their rent and can't feed their families right now, a central bank can't help them with that, right? So if you think that there's a disconnect that, that the stock market is doing well and everybody else is not, it's not really true. What's happening is this, the, the central banks are doing their best 
to get money into the economy and a lot of it ends up in the stock market. It's just the way things are. Um, but if they didn't do that, we would be in worse shape in the short term as well. So I, you created the Giordano, Giordano Bruno Instituto. So can you tell us about yeah. um, what is that institute about and how you manage that? It's just an idea. I've been writing about it for 20 years and it has two important parts. And, and remember, my goal is, is long run economic growth to help people around the world rise up into the middle class. I mean, that's billions of people. That's, what, that's the kind of thing I care about. So my goal is to first uh, create, get funding from, it's got to be nonprofit, so it has to be donations from some people who believe in what I'm doing to get a, co it's, it's in three phases. So the first phase is to get a cohorts of young people who are maybe 25 to 30 into a group to work together to start to learn how to understand the world through, through the scientific method and cost benefit analysis this is these are the people i hope that in 20 years they will be the regulators they will be the the politicians they will be the ones in charge i want to get them now because i've been to brussels i've given a speech in brussels about how we really need to change and how innovation is so critical and they're they're just asleep and seriously in brussels it's impossible all the 50 and 60 year old people there are impossible to change. So I want to go find young people who are going to be running things in 20 years. And I want to help them use scientific method to look at evidence, to make evidence-based decisions, Bayesian reasoning, and then cost benefit analysis to try to figure out what's right for the world. And you know, I've written a lot about, about climate change. And I think that's really a, a distortion of science. I think we have a lot of work to do to put science back on track, the funding of science and the application of science to our everyday lives. So that's the first way is to get young people to work together to help learn and communicate how to use the scientific method to their peers. Second wave is to build a community around that of people around the world. You might have heard of a book called Radical Markets. Do you know that book? Radical Markets? I didn't write it, but I heard about it, yes. By Whale, Whale and Posner. And this book has created meetups and community and people really thinking differently. And that's really exciting to me. So I want to build a community of young people who are using the scientific method and cost-benefit analysis, all this rationality. And not, it's not religious. It's not, it's not a belief system that you can't challenge. You have to challenge everything and look at hard at evidence of what's really going on to see the world the way it is. Just as I explained with the Amazon and the 5%, we, have, we want to see the world exactly as it is, not as we think it is. And so I want them to learn to communicate and build community. And then the third phase, on top of this community, you need community to build open source. I want to build open source tools so that we can have the personal data locker eventually will be the operating system that runs your phone. So I hope in 20 years, whatever the name of this operating system is, it's the one that's running your phone. And that's what I've written quite a bit about. That's what my book was about, that, that um, we, we need to empower people by helping them get, you know, you know, you don't have your DNA right now. You probably haven't had a DNA, uh, uh, your DNA collected, have you? Not yet. I have. And my DNA is sitting on the server of a company called 23andMe, and they use it for their research purposes. It's fine. But, you know, in a few years, everybody's DNA is going to be used to manufacture drugs and to help be, it'll be part of their health profile, their health records. And it's much better if we own that than if uh, Pfizer owns that. Don't you think? Okay. Right? Because... Pfizer will be very happy to store your DNA data for you and no charge, no charge at all. It's free, but you are the product. If it's free, you are the product and your DNA will be used to make their drugs better for you and their comp competitors won't have a chance. It's just like Amazon, it's just like Google. They want it to benefit them, not their competitors. 
So again, we could see a monopoly in, in uh, genetically driven healthcare. And that would be bad, right? Because we want competition. We want lots of things coming out and being able to use your DNA data. And it should be in, under your possession. It could be on a blockchain. It could be wherever you want to store it. It should be encrypted. Fine. It should be yours, your property. You know, when you give a, a, a review at Amazon on the website, that's not your property. That's Amazon's property. Your product reviews are Amazon's property. They resell that data to other companies. It's not yours anymore. So that's a problem I want to solve. I want to build this nonprofit institute to educate young people and to build an open source ecosystem platform for personal data at the center and then all the services that you want to come to you. And the book is called Pull because the idea is that there's no apps, there's just services and you say what you want and then the services come bring it to you. So in my world, in my, what I, the world I hope to build, there are actually no apps. There are, and there are almost, and almost everything is a service that can come work with your data to give you what you want. And that includes, and now let's talk about education. Can we? Yeah, go ahead. That includes your education, which you should not get from an educational institution because that model has failed. So we have this, uh, you and I both went to school for, I went to school for eight years, and then I went out into the world of work. Eight years of school. You know, what did I learn? Nothing that I need anymore, nothing that I, I don't remember any of it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> that's not true. I got a few things, a few skills, but not the actual knowledge was nothing. And this, this architecture of go to school first and then go to work is broken, and it broke a long time ago. I think COVID is actually, I hope, accelerating the destruction of schools because schools are mostly buildings with a lot of, a lot of maintenance of buildings and real estate, and that's not what we need. We need lifelong learning and working together. Learn by doing. When you're 18 years old, you should go get a job, and you should work with your personal assistant and your personal data to keep learning, learning, learning everything you need. And you know, we're, getting, we're gonna be getting much older. People born today will live mostly to 90 and 100 years old, right? So they're gonna be working well into their 70s and 80s. And the four years of school is gonna mean, is, it never really meant anything. It was always just a certificate, a signal, you know? And that's really not worth as much as we think. We have to train, uh, employers to stop looking at the school signal. I mean, people are impressed. I went to Stanford and then I took some courses at Harvard. So what? That doesn't, that's really just signaling. It doesn't make me a smarter person at all. Plenty of criminals have gone to Stanford and then, you know, taken billions of dollars out of banks. I mean, it's, it's not, it, what we want to do is get rid of the signaling and go toward a meritocracy where anyone can learn, anyone can build, anyone can do things that are valuable. And it's not about the, the, the names that are on your resume. Um, so let's destroy, let's creatively destroy education as we know it. And this interweaving of working, working and learning for your whole life as you go is what the Giordano Bruno Institute is all about. So I want to kind of blast away the, the status quo of institutional learning and, and create this interlaced world of working. And, and, and it's all going to be based on your data and your personal career coach who is an AI bot who helps you learn what you want to learn, helps you get where you want to go. Here's a good example, Dennis. Uh, I, I don't know why, but some people decide they want to go to film school so they can make films. I believe this is insane. Um, it's kind of like going to business school so you can do business. I don't understand that. Um, you, can name, you can name dozens and dozens of really top business people and they never went to business school in their lives. Um, that's, what, that's why I wanted to be the dean of Stanford Business School, to make some big changes and make it so you don't need any more deans of business schools because the MBA is not a good product. 
Um, and it hasn't been really, it's just a signal. It's not really helping people. So I want to see <clears throat> that I want to create a system where it, the, this personal assistant uses your data and instead, instead of training you or having you learn something, it might say, you know, there's this job that just opened up right now and you can get paid to learn what you want to learn. Why don't you switch and go apply for, go take this job and it'll apply for you and it'll try to get you in. It won't be this resume system and this, uh, this interview system. Your personal assistant will go do that for you. So a lot of times a good job is better than an expensive education that you have to repay later. And in this world that I want to create, there is a market for these helpers. So let's call them bots or personal assistants. All right. And there, when you have your per, your data, all your data for all your education, all your work, all your legal stuff, all your, uh, all your, um, uh, healthcare, all your uh, living and moving and where do you've, what you've done, all of that's yours. Now you can hire a personal digital assistant to come work with you as your career coach and help you find the next job and learn the next thing. You can also find another one that is your doctor and it's your primary doctor and it can use the healthcare system to navigate the things you need, whatever tests you need and whatever specialists you need. All that can be digital. All that can be automated, all can be AI. And again, your lawyer can be a bot, can be a digital assistant that is specialized in law, and it can work with other specialized bots that are, speci that are in certain specialties. And the important thing about what I want to build, Dennis, is that if you don't like your personal assistant, you fire it. You go to the marketplace and you get a new one because your personal data stays with you. It's not on the servers of you know, Google or Amazon, it's your personal data. And if a better doctor comes along, you just let that doctor go, stop paying it, stop, you know, you hire it and you, you bring in the new one and you pay that one. So this is an open source system where anyone can create a better personal assistant, a better bot. And if you hire it, that company is going to make money. But if that one doesn't perform or there's a better one, you're going to fire it and you're going to get a better one for you. So you'll have a group of personal digital assistants working with your data and working with all the data out in the world and on the web online to help improve your life. And it will be a market driven uh, uh, system so that if you don't like the bot, you just let it go and get a different one. That's the operating system I want to build. Yeah, and I think it's the vision as well for society. So, so in terms of, um, and I think we're wrapping up in a moment, because yeah. we've been uh, passing one hour and yeah. something. But I think we'll have a, probably a follow up because there's a lot of ideas we just touch. So I think one of the things. So you you start the the George Bordano, George 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 um, Giordano, Giordano Bruno, Bruno. Sorry, Giordano Bruno. <laughs> Giordano Bruno, of course, the 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 very influential Italian. Um, but I think the most important thing right now is is kind of. How do you see, and, and I know that you are in a, as well in a transition in your career and doing a lot of other things. We have, you've been researching a lot about COVID-19 and, and the machine economy and as well digital. So there's, of course, there's all the challenge of this, but we have a, a right now a massive acceleration of digital transformation possible thanks to COVID-19 and a lot of things happening right now. So um, how do you see this moment and as well the opportunities and the challenge that we're facing right now? As I, as I said, I think that this pandemic and maybe a future pandemic of another virus is a really big problem because we just don't know. Are schools going to open in September in the United States? Maybe 50% chance. We don't know. Um, is it going to get worse? Uh, I wrote a piece, you probably read, that there is no peak, that this is a process of getting across, that all of us have to get to immunity. And that's hundreds of millions, billions of people in the world have to go from not immune to immune and how long will that take and what will it take there's no way to answer these questions Dennis so it could be the next certainly the next six months I think it's really the next two years before we're kind of comfortably on the other side where it's not a big worry I mean we're seeing deaths go up deaths are rising now I don't know about in Europe I think they're relatively flat 
But that doesn't mean everybody can go back to work either. And that doesn't mean we can travel. But as you say, it's an opportunity. So how many of those meetings you got in an airplane and you stayed in a hotel and you went to a business meeting, how many of those are really worthwhile? It's a lot of overhead and a lot of expense. So I think a lot of meetings, a lot of uh, learning, a lot of things we could do from our, you know, in our pajamas are going to be better, right? I would yeah. I keep saying that I think it's going to be about 20% of what was good from the old practices will come back and 80% wasn't really worth it. And it's not coming back in a lot of cases. Telemedicine is a good example, right? We can do so, this is accelerating telemedicine in a huge way. That's fantastic, right? We don't need to show up in a, in a doctor's office to get a, a dermatology exam, generally. <clears throat> We're gonna have better and better and better tools so that we can do more and more and more remotely. And that's, the, I think that's great. So I want to probably as a wrap up and then definitely I think we'll have a part two of this interview, but uh, l let's go through this part of the uh, you know, one of your last articles that I like particularly, the machine economy, because I think it summarizes all the things that we're talking and a lot of your ideas. Mm. So your title is The Machine Economy is Coming, We're Not Prepared. So um, can you elaborate on this? Because I think this is for me a critical element because it touches uh, AI, machine learning, uh, big yeah. data and a lot of other things and as well your ideas in terms of digital money and as well the identity of data and society 5.0 well let me let me try to make it quick my main point is that we are right now in the transition period between 10,000 years of civilization of person-to-person -person commerce person-to-person -person business person-to-person -person education okay and that's clear. And then starting, I don't know, however, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, we started to have person to machine. So we have the person to machine economy where we have user interfaces and we interact with machines. And that's what we're doing now. This is the person to machine economy. In this economy, uh, people play chess against machines. And that's interesting right now. Or they play go against machines. And that's kind of interesting. Well, it was until a few years ago. And now, and when we build a self-driving car, the self-driving car drives on the road with the majority of other cars driven by humans, right? So, and, it, and it, it's better to be in a self-driving car because the self-driving car is a better driver than most of the other humans on the road. I know you're the best driver in the world, whoever, <laughs> whoever lived, or everybody who's watching is above average, I understand, but but the self-driving cars are already better than the average driver. And, but they're driving against other humans. So for another, so right now we're about 20% of the way into this machine economy where machines talk to other machines. And they do that mostly in markets, in, mar in uh, the bots and the trading and, and the automated trading and the algorithms that can, but the mostly, of, if you think about the algorithms at Amazon or Netflix, they're thinking, well, what do you want to watch to, to buy next? They're predicting human behavior. They're not trading with machines. You don't have a bot that is buying the stuff you need from Amazon for your home. You have to do it. You're interfacing with their machine, right? And by 2050 or 2060, somewhere, we'll be 80% into the machine economy. And after that, and this is important, forever after that, forever, it will be the machine economy. It will be machines <clears throat> doing business with machines for us. doesn't mean we're out of the picture. It means that the machines will do our negotiating and our business for us, and we will be more out of the picture. And in that world, humans are not allowed to drive on the road because humans cause problems. In the machine economy, the cars talk to each other. The cars share information. The cars talk to satellites. The cars get information back from what's on the road ahead. The cars are all connected and the road is connected and all the devices on the road are connected and there's no way a human can, can navigate that. In that world, all the cars can go 120 kilometers an hour with very close spacing because they know what's ahead. They can predict it. They're all working together to get so the something like the volume you know of traffic on a road will go up by 10 times because the cars can coordinate 
okay? And in that world, the, the computers have no desire to play chess with humans. That's ridiculous, right? In that world, uh, the bots will do most of the work. They'll even babysit your children better than humans. Now, of course, there's going to be human elements. I'm not saying that the robots are taking over the world, but, but most of the services will need to be done better machine to machine. But that's forever. So I want people to understand we're in a very short window of time right now of about 50, 60, 70 years where it's this transition period. And I want people to realize that the transition period we're in right now where we have, you know, apps and interfaces and human interfaces and cars that are cool to drive and buttons in elevators all of that people think well it's just going to get better incrementally in the future no it's all going away that's all going to be plowed under the machine economy will destroy everything we're innovating right now and become forever something else so anyone who is 20 right now 20 25 30 years old right now coming into the world of work is going to be in this very uh is going to come into a unique time in history where they're going to spend most of their career in the human to machine economy. And then they exit their career. And everybody after that, everybody born 10 years from now is just going to live in the machine economy. And it's going to be completely different. That's, that's very important because people are thinking that I think that that perspective is important to understand for planning your career. And, and the, your vision of that is actually quite positive because, for instance, when you touch yeah. about this area, we can think about uh, artificial intelligence, singularity, uh, AGI, a lot of different things. So, in your vision, is actually very pragmatic and less. Um, uh, even, for instance, of the things I've been writing, I'm more dramatic than you are. And for instance, if you see Ben Gordsell that thinks that we only have one AGI, that will be that. So. Do you think we'll have that capacity or how do you see this vision with the reality of the geopolitics and the reality of the world? Because, for instance, China is already creating a huge amount of uh, artificial intelligence driven monetary society. The rest of the world is very cryptic and very fragmented in terms of the way we're looking for this. There's no really consensus in terms of this. But there's an effect that effectively the machine or the machine to machine economy is there. So how, how do you see this part from a geopolitics and from a humanity humanity history because if you look at history of humanity and actually if you look at Arari which is probably the biggest thought leader in the world that has been talking about this at least in mainstream um, it's been actually more alarmist being as well an historian himself and I am a bit as well coming from a poetry background and literature I normally think the ideas are a bit crazy so tell me about that because it's one of the things that I'm particularly nervous about it uh, Harari also believes in global warming, and so I, I just show the data. I'm showing the data. In the past, there has been gradual warming for the last 200 years. In the past, every time there's new innovations in technology, it creates more jobs over and over and over. New innovation, new technology creates more jobs. And some people say, well, that's going to break. That's going to stop. Why? Why? So, so we can go back to doing repetitive jobs and accounting and dishwashing and cooking in restaurants and, you know, vacuuming and house cleaning. Is that what we really want? That, that's all going to go away. Machines will do that. And that's great. There will be plenty of jobs. There are always plenty of jobs. We'll probably hit about nine to 10 billion people later this century in the, in the world. And we'll have better air quality, we'll have more trees, we'll have greener, <clears throat> greener environment, we'll have a higher quality environment, <clears throat> and the middle class will be the dominant class. And that is what's really exciting to me. We'll have much fewer people in poverty. And it's not gonna be everywhere. So you can be worried about some, some, some of the mega cities, perhaps, some of the in, uh, places. I'm a little worried about Bangladesh, but then a friend of mine, I was talking about Bangladesh. He said, no, actually, Bangladesh is going to come out of it okay. There's going to be enough entrepreneurs, enough new minds, enough, enough uh, competition and new, uh, cap new uh, possibilities that 
humanity is going to rise tremendously, just as we have in the past 200 years. 200 years ago, it was 97% farmers. And poverty was 90% as well, so yeah. It was, I, day, really... it was day to day, hand to mouth. Nobody had one month of rent even. That, that, was, that was too much. Right. So uh, I think it's, it's so um, I will, well, there's a lot of things here. So, uh, uh, and I think I have plenty of other things. So we are in one hour and a half plus. plus. <laughs> so I, I think, so uh, David, it's been a fantastic pleasure. And uh, there's a lot of ideas here to continue probably. And let's do a second session where we go more for the ideas and different things. So um, for the people that are listening to us and as a wrap up, so I know that you are very active on Medium. Um, yeah. You are with Giorgiano Bruno Institute. So give yeah. us a bit of what you're doing and where people can find you. And as well, um, we're going to put all of that, of course, in, in the text, but it's always good sure. to hear from you. Uh, the main point is dsegel.com because that's the index of everything. So you can find everything there, dsegel.com, D-S-I-E-G-E-L.com. On Medium, on Twitter, I'm at Poll News because of this book, because I've been doing it for 10 years, Poll News is my handle on Medium and Twitter. And uh, I do have 25,000 uh, connections on, on LinkedIn, but anybody who looks uh, smart and interesting is welcome to connect to me on LinkedIn as well. I'm, I'm always on LinkedIn attacking the alarmists. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like, I like uh, and it's good that you finish in a positive, because I think the good thing about uh, all your thought leadership is about actions and as well about positivity, which is great because a lot of the, the activists and as well people are very negative and as well very not so much fact-driven as well or at least research-driven. Um, David, it's been a huge pleasure and honor. Um, we'll definitely make part two. Don't be very far from here. And we'll as well have a lot of things that are going to be following up. Thank you so much. Looking forward. Thank you, Dennis.